Hello folks and welcome back to part two of the Plastic Free Camping Series. So in part one, I attempted to do a, an overnighter camping um, using, my goal was to use no plastic. Uh, the reality was, I think there was definitely some plastic and we'll go through some of that um, in this video. Um, so what I'm going to run through now is just the gear I took, um, where I got it if I, if I know, and I'll put links to the various places I bought these, these items. Um, so if anyone's interested, they can follow up. Now, I will start off by saying I bought all this gear myself. I wasn't sponsored, so it is my honest opinion of how I found stuff. Um, and I'm sure there are lots of other alternatives. So if, if people, you know, have gone through a similar exercise and, you know, interested in adding comments below on alternatives, then definitely please feel free to do so. That'll be a, a great, a great contribution to the whole idea. So I think it can be broken down into three areas. Um, one area is where you don't really need to compromise at all. It's gear that is readily available and we use um, and doesn't contain plastic. I think there's a second group where if you do a bit of searching and you, you know you can find gear but there are compromises and often those compromises are either weight or price. Um, I think those are sort of the main two I would say. Um, I mean they're not the only ones but they are probably the two areas you will mostly compromise on. And then the third area, I think, is where it, you know, plastic has so come to dominate what we use that it's very hard to find alternatives or that the alternatives just aren't as practical. So I'll start off with the first section and work my way through. Okay, so the first section, I think, are really the sort of tools and utensils that, that you use. Um, so for, you know, cooking, I had the Zebra Billy, and this is the, the 12 inch one, the small one, or 12 centimeters, I think it is, widely available, widely used. And, you know, okay, there are lighter versions with titanium, etc. but, you know, people would quite happily use um, one of these. Likewise, the small brew pot Billy can, um, once again, widely used, easily available. This one's from the Bushcraft store. This one, I'm not sure where I got it from, possibly there as well, but it's they're widely available. In fact, it must have been come from the Bushcraft store because they came in um, these canvas bags. So quite handy for keeping your dirty pots separate from any of the other gear. But they are canvas, so I guess there's a minimal amount of plastic in them. One of the issues definitely with a lot of gear, even with the traditional materials, they still often use these plastic toggles. And I guess an alternative to those is much harder. But it, it is a minimal part of the whole overall bit of kit um, so it's not too much of a compromise but I think cooking um, there's no issue like I was with a frying pan this was a um, Petromax made in Germany all steel and um, you know readily available but heavier maybe than some of the alternatives but you know if you're not going too far then it's not too much of a compromise and very easily available so cooking you know not too much of a problem I think um, it's the same with some of the tools, the spork, this is also from the Bushcraft store. Um, cheap, easily available, and a lot of people use them, so didn't really find a problem there. Um, the tools then, so, you know, starting off with the axe, no problems there. Most people would, would know that an axe, you know, unless there's some sort of plastic in the sheath, but this one doesn't even have any stitching, metal rivets, leather sheath metal and wood so you know that's an easy one this one i got from now there'll be a i will recommend this company because i've got a few items in this bit of gear from this company and it's called bushcraft spain um i got them on the internet from these guys i think some of the stuff i bought through their etsy store and some from their website um and i i'll definitely recommend these guys i have you know bought a few things from them and they've been a pleasure to work with you know, when I have any queries, I've emailed them and, you know, they communicate very quickly, very efficiently and they stock a nice lot of traditional gear as well. They seem to be one of the last places now you can find these bask axes. So they probably know the, the maker and have a, a connection with them. But if you're after a bask axe, they almost seem to be one of the last places you can be able to get them. But highly recommend the Bushcraft Spain and I'll touch on some others that I bought from them. So, you know, otherwise tools, the Openel, old design, been made for years, 
metal and wood. No compromise. The knife that I chose to use on this trip was this um, Puko. Now this was handmade, I got it on Etsy. Uh, I think it was a maker in Ukraine. I'll put a link to it, it's called JER Knife. And um, really lovely sort of traditional style Puko. The insert in this sheath I think is actually wood as well. I think some of the more modern ones they often put plastic inserts in there, it looks like a wooden one. So in this instance, once again, you know, that's all wood and leather and metal, no problems. The um, fire lighting I used was a ferro rod, leather sheath, nicely made. I got this on Etsy as well. Um, once again, somebody from Eastern Europe, I think. Really, not, these longer ones are much easier to use, I think, to light fires. Beautifully made piece. And, um, you know, a lot of people have those. And Well, any ferro rod, really, it's, it's no problem. No compromise there on that one. Um, the stove, because obviously I, also, I did cook on the open fire, but um, in the morning I used my firebox nano um can't remember where i got this from but they are readily available from a number of online retailers but this um, i haven't tried the other products which are bigger but this firebox nano is just so good i mean it literally can fit in your pocket and um you know just runs off some kindling and it's just incredible how, how you know with the the box itself opens out so it doesn't it keeps the fire off the ground um so very impressed with that particular stove um, but, you know, there are lots of alternatives, very similar, so easily available, and, you know, there's no plastic in, in this product. Um, the saw that I used was this folding buck saw. Um, it's smaller than the normal ones you see that are made out of wood, but it's, you know, it was very cheap. I got it from a military surplus store. Um, I, I, I can't remember which one. I'll see if I can find it, but it was very cheap for what it is. came with two blades. Um, it's a little bit, as I say, a bit shorter, so the, the strokes are a bit smaller, but, you know, it's quite lightweight. I think it's just an aluminium tube, um, very small, and, you know, you choose this over potentially another saw. The only one is the Baco Lapland or something like that, which has a plastic handle, which, you know, you may choose an, as an alternative. But this wasn't much of a compromise and very good bit of kit. Gloves were quite useful, obviously, for handling hot um, kit around the fire. Um, leather, they had a aluminium carabiner. And these ones, I probably got these from the Bushcraft store as well. They're the Helicon Tex, um, and they weren't too expensive, but very, very useful. And most people would pretty much carry leather gloves anyway for camping these days if you're using any the hot um, utensils around the fire. Um, so now, the stitching may have a nylon in it, um, I'm not going to say they don't, um, so, but what, these are these types of items I think we start to find, plastic has crept in, but they're not throwaway, you're probably going to use these for a long time, and the plastic is fairly minimal. So I think that that's pretty much the first section of these, I think your tools, etc, um, it's quite easy to not use plastic, or to have very, very minimal amounts of plastic. Um, and you're not, not having much of a compromise in, in terms of, you know, cost or, or weight. That's what you'd use anyway. Okay, so to the second section, which is what I would say you can find gear to use, but there is a compromise. Um, and that really started off around all the sort of um, the gear I was using to carry, sleep in and shelter, that sort of thing. Um, so I'll start off with the rucksack that I used. So this rucksack um, is one from Frost River. I think it's Isle Royale Junior or one of those. They have quite a few different options. Um, but anyway, it's made out of very robust canvas and leather and brass fittings. So pretty much the whole thing is, you know, traditional materials. The only bit I would say that you once again got this plastic toggle on the side, but it looks like the cord, no, the cord might have some nylon in as well. Um, so a very small amount though, but generally um, a traditional made and, you know, functioning rucksack. So the compromise on this one would be, it's it's quite expensive as far as I recall. I have had it a number of years, I'm not too sure where I bought it, but um, it's it's obviously it's more expensive than um, one of the, the cheaper synthetic rucksacks. And it's also much heavier. Um, this does weigh quite a lot. 
Now what I tend to use this one for is if I'm going to the forest with some tools, axes, knives for just a day out, um, take my brew pot with me, you know, I'm not traveling far and I'm not carrying loads of gear, I often use this because it's stronger and I'm not worried about tools damaging it. So it is a useful piece of kit that I use anyway, but for a overnight or um, longer, you know, you've got a weight issue to contend with, but you know, you can get um, a relatively, well, pretty much mostly plastic free um, rucksack these days. Um, very good quality, these things. They're built like a tank. So, you know, if you, if you are interested in these, then definitely highly recommended. Okay, so the next section was the sleeping arrangements and I didn't have, obviously I wasn't going to take a tent. Most tents these days are synthetic and likewise with sleeping bags. So the options I chose to take was an oil skin tarp and a woolen blanket and a ventile uh, poncho as a ground sheet. So the oil skin tarp that I took was one that I got from Bushcraft Spain, which I mentioned earlier. It's really such a well-made, amazing um, top. Very high quality, very, you know, strong. Is a lot heavier than normal top, um, for sure. But, you know, from what I understand, it's linen and, and oil, and that's how they make these things. This one's got a nice outer bag. And then, um, as I said on the video, what I used was some sisal cordage to tie it up with. Um, I'll get onto cordage later, but um, this oil skin top, um, work very well work just you know just as well as any other top but uh, it is heavier and uh, is more pricey so you've got to compromise on that side so the next uh, item i used was this ventile poncho so it's no no different to the army style ponchos you get that you that double up as shelters or ground sheets this one is made by hilltrek and they are based in scotland uh, and i believe they make all their gear there in scotland and the ventile is a product that's made predominantly from cotton so I don't know for sure but it's probably close to 100% cotton um, I don't want to guarantee that but you know in terms of the use of plastic in something like this it's, it's going to be minimal um, they have got the plastic uh, toggles and things as I said you find on most of these things now but um, you know this is quite a robust sturdy item and you know doubles up as a as a raincoat as well so um, very good these Ventile and particularly Hilltrek. I've got a smock as well from them and um, definitely recommend them. So that was my ground sheet. And then after the ground sheet, this was what I used to um, keep myself warm at night. So it's a Merino blanket, once again, Bushcraft Spain. And in this instance, it is claimed, it's, you know, they've stated that it's 100% pure uh, Merino wool. Um, now, Compromise here, it's quite bulky, um, relatively heavy, but it's not that heavy, it's more just the size. But um, beautifully made, um, you know, it is a lovely piece of kit. You, you know, you can smell the lanolin, you know, from the, from the merino wool. Amazing, um, amazingly well made and, you know, high quality blanket this. This one was a smaller, you had an option to get a bigger one, which, you know, would have actually worked better as a sleeping blanket. Um, because what I found with this one, you know, I was trying to bundle myself up at night um, and, you know, it was separating out and I was in contact with the cold ground. So, you do, you know, it was getting cold through the night. Um, but, you know, the bigger blanket would have worked, but it would have been more bulky and a bit heavier and probably more expensive as well. So, as I say, you can do it, but there are compromises. But once again, Bushcraft Spain, highly recommended, amazing products that they're producing. So the clothing that I took once again fell falls into this category where I'd say it's a it's it's doable but there's a bit of a compromise. Um, so I'll start off by uh, with the trousers that I used. Now these are moleskin with ventile uh, knee patches and some leather detailing on the badge, etc. Got these from. Um, Bison Bushcraft in the UK. They are made in the UK. Um, it's quite an interesting company. They, they, I think they sort of subcontract to individual um, tailors and seamstresses who make up the, the clothes for them. So once you place an order, it takes a while for it to be produced. But there's something really nice about that, sort of, in, you know, keeping the home industries going. And, you know, people make really high quality gear in the, in the UK. 
So compromises on these obviously is going to be availability and um, price. Um, I bought these quite a few years ago now because of the, because of the warmth. They're really warm trousers and with the ventile um, knee patches, you know, there's a bit of durability added in. One of the things I did notice though is that they are not 100% wool. Now, moleskin's supposed to be a wool product, ventile's a cotton product, but this the, the label actually says it's 80% wool and 20% other fibres. They don't detail what those are, but I suspect it's, you know, threads etc and whatever else they've used to make this um is going to have some synthetic materials but you know as compromises go it's the closest i could get um you can get 100 percent cotton trousers but i haven't managed to find an easy source for them yet but uh these are obviously quite warm as well so that those were the trousers the shirt that i wore is actually uh, the label says 100 percent cotton so it's like a uh cotton um, tool material. Um, this one I've had for many, many years. South African company, uh, they were very well known at one stage, TSAV. Um, been going since around the First World War, making workwear and I think some military wear as well. Um, recent years, I think mostly just workwear and some safari gear. Whether their modern equivalents still are 100% cotton, I'm not sure. Um, but, you know, you possibly can buy this sort of equivalent elsewhere now if anyone knows you know feel free to add that in but that was that so that is pretty much from what i can gather apart from maybe the buttons they must be plastic i guess um that was you know, as close as i could get to no plastic for the warm top that i took this is another bison bushcraft product and it's, I think, very much a bison bushcraft version of the original Swan Dry bush shirts. Um, this one is, um, the label does say 100% wool. Um, now, obviously, the stitching may be um, synthetic, but certainly the product itself is 100% wool. So um, they've got a leather badge. Um, now, the buttons, I suspect, are probably synthetic. But it's it's such a lovely warm piece of gear. This um, definitely recommend this one. And once again, you know, it's made in England by individual makers, um, and you know, very little, if any, synthetic material. So that was bison bison bushcraft. Um, interestingly, the Swan Dry equivalent, which you can get probably slightly more readily available, and also um, is going to be cheaper. They have a, a sort of a yoke inside the shoulder, which is made out of synthetic material. So, you know, it states on the label, 100% wool, apart from the synthetic liner. Um, so that one, if you were going to go on that route, it's it's not quite the 100% wool. But um, it's more readily available and, um, and I said it cheaper. So for sleeping in, I took some wool power um, undergarments. So these are the, uh, the you know, the top of the trousers they're really nice to sleep in and they are once again they are predominantly wool made from wool but i think in order to get the stretch and you know make these products they do use a portion of synthetic material now um i can't remember it might be 80 20 um i think is what they said on this yeah so it's 80 percent um, merino wool and 20 percent other fibers so once again, you know, you're getting close, but you're not all the way there to fully natural materials. Um, so this is in the compromise section. I think it's hard to find something. And it might be that if you did have 100% wool, it wouldn't function as well, wouldn't stretch, etc. Um, but those are my clothes. For the shoes that I took, um, these are, um, you know, handwag hiking boots. Now I wear these a lot in the summer um, and they don't have any Gore-Tex lining which is one of the reasons I really like them so you know in the summer I find that Gore-Tex can just be too hot. Um, these are these are nice shoes they're really robust you can resole them so that you know if once you've worn them in you can wear them for a long time and just keep resoling them um, as they wear out. So they're the closest I could get that 
I think the stitching once again might have synthetic material, but it's a very minimal amount. The eyelets all metal, leather boots, and you know, I guess predominantly rubber sole, but there might be synthetic in there as well. But they're not going to be something you're going to discard, you're going to be using for a long time to get a good quality pair. These handbags are very good quality, really, really like them. Um, and you know, very little synthetic material in them, so definitely recommended. So that leads me into the third category, which is where I think is um, a big compromise to be made to try and use um, natural materials, and that is any kind of packaging, um, food, water, um, and, and cordage is the other one. You know, I think most of the cordage we use is going to be bank line or paracord, and that's all made out of synthetic material. So the cordage uh, problem I got around by using sisal rope. So this is the sisal rope that I used. Now I got this from, I think my father, it was some stuff he had many, many years ago and I've had it for years and years. Um, so I don't know how easy it is to get, you know, sisal. I would imagine it, it you know, you can still get it, but it's not going to be the product that's easily available in the camping shop. Um, now Bushcraft Spain do do a version of this that I think they've put uh, wax on as well. Um, but uh, you know, once again, it's going to be slightly less available and a bit more expensive. But you know, you can get, as I say, they they they're a great shop for looking at more traditional materials, and they do provide something along those lines. But this one, I you know, I was given it to my, by my father many years ago, but it was a good solution. You know, this is pretty much, I think, hundred percent natural and, and biodegradable. So cordage is your first challenge, I think. The modern cordages are so good and so easily available and so cheap, it's going to be much harder to replace them. Um, the next one, you know, was carrying food items. So for the water and milk that I took with me, um, I did have a solution. Um, and this is a while back, I was looking at plastic-free alternatives for taking to work. And I found these... Um, and there are a number around nowadays, um, so it's, it's a metal container, it's got a metal and wooden top, and then the seal, which is the one area which is quite hard to achieve, is made out of silicon. So it is actually a biodegradable material, and there's no plastic on it. Um, once again, probably less readily available and slightly more expensive, but maybe not such a big compromise. But you think about a lot of the bottles, water bottles you normally get for camping, they're all plastic based and you know they, they're just easy to make they're cheap and the, the seals in particular is where the challenge lies so carrying the food was the other area and I did mention it in the first video um, I used some wax cotton cloth that I was actually given by a friend a few years ago he found it at a show and um, you know there are canvas bag options you can use but if you think we want to keep something watertight um, you know plastic bags are so useful for carrying any kind of food. Um, so that is the area I'd say I found the hardest and I wouldn't say it was necessarily that easy. If you're going for more than one night, um, I think at this point in time, and you know, happily, if anyone has an alternative, please add it into the comments. But I would say that's the one area I'd struggle to replace plastic bags, plastic containers for carrying food for more than one night. Um, so that, you know, that was probably the biggest challenge. Um, the other areas that I, you know, I didn't show it in the video, but I did, um, just for transparency, I did take a first aid kit with me. I think it's sensible to do so. And this bag and the contents, you know, plastic, you know, the bandages, etc., will be wrapped in plastic. And it keeps them, you know, hygienic and sterilized and you know it's not something you really want to compromise too quickly on so I think at this point in time if you someone who does take a first aid kit with you on, on your trips and you know, that's definitely a good idea um, that's going to be quite hard for some of the items to replace them and then I think lastly you know where does it leave us with things like the Mora knives now one of my videos I discussed this knife and I said it was a very good option and um, and it is, I still believe it is, but it's so full of plastic, it would definitely not have worked on my video. Plastic sheath, I've got some paracord wrapped around it, 
it's got a plastic handle. So my take on this would be, I think where the problem, we need to start using plastic more responsibly. It's such a useful material, but it's because we don't use it responsibly. We throw it around and we, you know, particularly one time use is where the real dangers exist. Something like this knife, now I anticipate unless I lose it or severely damage it, I'll be using this knife, you know, for the rest of time. There's no reason it shouldn't last for a long time. Um, so the plastic in it is not going to be, you know, added to landfill, you know, hopefully not in my lifetime. Um, so I do think there's a place for responsible use of plastic and it's going to be much harder to get away from that. And, you know, things like this, it's extremely cheap, very, very good. Um, and the plastic in it is inert and hopefully will not be added to any landfill. So that's my take on that one. Hopefully this was a, an interesting follow-up to the actual camping video. And if anyone has ideas or suggestions of other alternatives that I'm not aware of or have not discussed, please, you know, discuss them in the comments and, you know, add any links. I'll add as many links as I can to the shops where I bought these from, um, if I can remember. And as I said, I'm not affiliated to any of them, so it's literally just for your information. Um, and hopefully that was of some use. So if you like this idea and you want to share it, then like and subscribe. Um, that's much appreciated. And um, I'll see you on the next one. So thanks for watching.